Pastor Mai, hello and welcome to this week's episode of Agenda. I'm Ewan Gorn. On the programme, the Manx government has promised to make more information available on who owns the companies registered here in a bid to improve transparency. But critics say the commitment is vague and lacks substance. Ramsey Courthouse appears to have a firmer future as a group emerges keen to redevelop the historic building into a community hub. And finally, we speak to the politician of the year. Major changes will be made to the way the Crown dependencies share information with international law enforcement, organisations, authorities and individuals. The Isle of Man, Jersey and Guernsey announced last week they will move towards opening up their beneficial ownership registers by the end of 2022 to improve accessibility and transparency. It's so they will comply with the European Union's fifth anti-money laundering directive, but done on a timescale to suit the three jurisdictions – The Isle of Man government aims to bring into force this legislation and any other necessary measures to establish a public register within 24 months of the EU review of the implementation process of this series of measures from the fifth anti-money laundering directive. So that would be by the end of 2023. As Chief Minister Howard Quayle explained to Tim Glover... Well, I suppose with Crown dependencies, and it's important that we work together, we have similar problems, concerns, and when it's working on the development of new policy, it's important that we work together on this, and and that's what we've done. Obviously, the way Europe was going with directives and the money val requirements, it was going to happen anyway, wasn't it? That was the direction of the wind. So are we jumping before we pushed? No, I've always said that we have a long-standing and independent verified threat record of meeting our international standards. The fifth anti-money laundering directive was coming in. It's coming in in the future. And it's therefore that when that starts to be implemented, that's the time that the Isle of Man and our colleagues in the, other, in the Crown dependencies move to complete comply with the rules and regulations of that. So we've set out a sort of a time frame and various procedures on how we're going to move forward. And just to bear in mind, the the Isle of Man is fully compliant with the current rules and regulations on beneficial ownership of, of companies. However, those rules are changing. The European Union is moving over a period of time with the fifth money laundering directive to have a public register. And we're setting out how we will be complying with those rules and regulations going forward. You mentioned that fifth directive will the UK be complying with that even though there's the Brexit scenario yes, this, going this on? is irrespective obviously of the European Union so the UK is still number one, one of 28 members of the European Union irrespective of that the the UK will be complying now it has set up its own register but I think the important Um, part of this is that in January 2022 the European Union will be reflecting on how its um, first go at having a public beneficial ownership register has gone and we will be looking at how that has gone too when they publish their results in January 2022 and we have said that we will then develop ours and the legislation to move it within a 12-month period after that review that the European Union has so we can look at what is best practice, what's worked, what hasn't worked, how can we ensure that our register complies and works closely with the European Union on their internationally transparent new rules on beneficial ownership for a public register. Will this quieten some opponents within Westminster, the likes of Margaret Hodge? Yeah, well, I I was always surprised, given that the fact that the Alamance track record is always to comply with international rules and regulations, and we can clearly show that, and it's not just me saying that, that's the OECD, I have always been surprised that... um, Dame Margaret Hodge, the Right Honourable Andrew Mitchell, have had these concerns. However, I think that by clearly setting out our road to movement to comply with the European Union um, Fifth Money Laundering Directive, that should reassure um, that the, the you know that we are taking the the Fifth Money Laundering Directive and the Public Register of Beneficial Ownership very seriously and will be complying with our international responsibilities. There is a directive or a suggestion from the Financial Action Task Force of a 25% threshold. So where does that leave someone at 24.9%? There's a loophole already. Well, as I say, Tim, the European Union are starting this now. I think eight countries have got loosely some form of 
public beneficial ownership register. They will be reviewing how it's worked in January 2022, and then we, as as the three crown dependencies, will be looking at that review, looking at the information the European Union provide to to develop legislation to move ours forward. So it's what's best practice at that period of time. Now, in the interim period, we will be developing our registers to be able to be automatically shared with the rest of the European Union and vice versa, their registries with us in, in the interim, that's in 21, so that there's a clear time path or, or time frame going forward on, on how we will move on this. Can you define public as in public beneficial ownership register? What does public mean? How public is public? Well, I, again, I don't, I don't want to... Um, Dodge the, the, the question. To, to me, it means people will be able to see who is the beneficial owner of, of a company. Anyone. Obviously. Well, there, there will be rules and regulations on certain, if people are vulnerable, if it's decided that a person is vulnerable to having their information shared, then the Fifth Money Laundering Directive allows for that information to be withheld. But this has to be worked up by the European Union, and that's why we're waiting until January 2022 to see what have they come up with as the way forward. There's also various other um, issues, how the registers work together for the sharing of information, data protection, and all these various rules and regulations. So come January 2022, we're saying that we will look at what the European Union have done for their beneficial ownership public register, and then we'll spend, within 12 months, we will be moving legislation, in our, or from our man point of view, in Timwald, to take forward legislation to set up a beneficial ownership of public record. So that's quite a, a big ticket item early in the next administration. It is indeed, but obviously my administration will, will be working this up and looking at um, working with the members of the European Union to, to see how this is going forward. So they won't suddenly have to do this cold. The, the, the groundwork, the foundations will, be, will have been put in place. Chief Minister Howard Quayle there speaking to Tim Glover. Well, in response to the Crown Dependencies announcement, John Christensen, the director at the Tax Justice Network, says despite their announcement, very little has happened and has called this latest development a complete failure. The Lobby Group is an independent international network launched in 2003, focused on research, analysis and advocacy in the area of international tax and financial regulation, including the role of tax havens. Mr Christensen gave his reaction to the Crown Dependency's purported new direction of travel to Dolan Mercer. Well, very little has actually been promised. Bear in mind that this um, issue of making the commercial registry of company ownership public has been under discussion for years. And for years, the Isle of Man, Jersey and Guernsey have been resisting it. All they've committed to, from what we can see, is to have a discussion four years from now about the general principles. They haven't actually committed to anything in particular. Um, and as far as we're concerned, this is a massive failure. You said that uh, this was the opposite of leadership, which there's sort of a suggestion there that it's been passed off as though it's a, a, a voluntary move. Is that fair? <laughs> well, it's, it, it is definitely not a voluntary move. As, uh, as everyone knows, uh, there's been huge pressure globally to make these registries publicly accessible. Um, European Union has moved in that direction. United Kingdom has moved in that direction years ago. Uh, Parliament has been discussing with the Crown dependencies for, for years now, um, uh, asking them to go ahead, initially very politely coming out from, from Prime, uh, Prime Minister Cameron, but more recently... Um, a cross-party group of MPs uh, headed by Andrew Mitchell on the Conservative side and Margaret Hodge on the Labour side have been pushing for, um, for um, a voluntary move, which so far the Crown dependencies have resisted. Now the, the Parliament is moving to enforce it. And so the claim that this is leadership is, of course, nonsense. They are under pressure considerable pressure because if they don't make this uh, make their registries publicly available then it will be imposed upon them by parliament so what would the tax justice network like to see is this is this a sufficient first step in the right direction or is it too little too late or something in between 
It's, uh, it's, it's, we don't know whether it's too little or what it is because they haven't actually been very specific about what they aim to do. But as far as we're concerned, they're simply kicking the can down the road to 2023. Uh, and that is far, far too, uh, too late. Uh, they should do it immediately. As I said on BBC, uh, you know, look, the Allies mounted the biggest military operation in history called D-Day, and it took them six months from starting to plan to implementing it. And here we have the Crown dependencies on a small issue to make their, their company registers publicly accessible. And they're saying, well, we'll start discussing it in 2024. This isn't leadership. It's the exact opposite of leadership. It's quite clear that they want to kick the can down the road as far as they possibly can. Since the announcements this week, um, certainly on the Isle of Man, we, we haven't seen a huge amount of public backlash or, or, or response. Why is it something that people should be interested in and should care about? Well, it's, it's quite shocking if there is no public response. And it's quite frankly quite shocking. And it's a reflection on of a public who, by and large, don't seem to care what happens on the island. It it's perfectly possible the people in the Isle of Man don't realise that very recently that they were awarded a tax haven score of 100, which says they're one of the most harmful tax havens in the world for corporate uh, tax avoidance. Uh, you know, it puts them right up at, at the top. Uh, and one has to you know, ask this question, why is the Isle of Man public either unaware of these things or not caring about these things because they are clearly causing a great deal of harm to the rest of the world. And, and there's no denying it because we know that hidden behind these secret offshore companies which don't disclose uh, their um, ownership, uh, all sorts of crimes are, are taking place, including, of course, tax evasion. But, you know, there's also a case under investigation where it's alleged that an Isle of Man company was used to funnel illegal campaign donations for political, uh, uh, the, the political leave campaign. Uh, and the Isle of Man public should care about this. And if they don't care about this, they should be wondering why on earth they're not caring about it. What's gone wrong? What's the matter with the culture? Um, Chief Minister Howard Quayle on the Isle of Man has said that the island meets international standards in respect of transparency of beneficial ownership information. Um, first of all, do you believe that's true? And and second of all, if it is true, um, are those standards appropriate, perhaps? Well, um, first of all, it's, it's just not true. So the Chief Minister should be challenged on this. Take a look at the Isle of Man's uh, secrecy score on the financial secrecy index it's, it's better certainly better than jersey only slightly better than jersey but um, uh, a lot better than, than guernsey guernsey scores worse to the crown dependencies but the truth of the matter is that the, the st existing standards globally are very weak indeed um, uh, and um, certainly need to be need to be uh, strengthened massively but there's a reason why they're so weak, and part of the reason that they are so weak is because Britain has been blocking attempts to strengthen uh, international standards here for many, many years. And, of course, the Isle of Man is very closely, you know, its, it's financial services sector is very closely woven in with the City of London. So there's a very good reason why the standards are so low. So I'm, I'm personally, I'm very unimpressed by what the Chief Minister has said. Why is it in the interests of the Crown dependencies to resist making their registers public is is it in the interests of business would they feel well it certainly isn't in the interests of legitimate business it's only in the, in the interests of criminals who hide hide themselves behind uh, uh offshore companies the, the truth of the matter is any legitimate business does not need to be this secretive the, the people who benefit from this are the lawyers the accounting firms and, and the crooks that, 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 that uh, are their clients uh, all the rest of the public don't benefit at all. And let's be quite clear about that. Um, there is a large enabling industry, and I've got a lot of experience of this myself from having worked offshore, and I was for a while, for, for over a decade, I was economic advisor to the government of Jersey. So I'm very familiar with this. There is a very large uh, number of uh, you know, enabling lawyers and accountants and, and bankers and other people like company and trust uh, administrators who they benefit from this, but they know very well that their clients are engaged in very dodgy activities. Just finally, um, to quote from the response put out from the Tax Justice Network, um, 
you said any any verified data must be readily available to the public from day one and that anything short of this cannot be considered mean, meaningful action. So at what point would the organisation sort of be content with the actions of the Crown Dependencies? Is it only when these registers are made fully public? Yes, uh, absolutely. We expect the register to be, be made fully public so that everybody, journalists, civil society organisations external creditors, anybody who has a legitimate interest to know what's happening within a company should have full access to to this information. And the point about verification is really important because we know from the um, United Kingdom's company register at at, at Company's House that a lot of the data that's stored there is out of date and in many cases is simply inaccurate. And therefore, we think it's really important that company directors and the lawyers and uh, company administrators who handle these companies are made responsible for verifying the data and making sure that the data is kept up to date. And if they don't do that, then there should be significant sanctions, not just fines, but in some cases, if they're, they're doing this on a regular uh, basis, uh, that might well well be um, loss of professional status and possibly even making them criminally liable for the, their failure to, to verify data and keep it up to date. John Christensen from the Tax Justice Network. And just to stress, the Isle of Man aims to bring into force laws and any other necessary measures to establish a public register by the end of 2023. You're listening to Agenda on Manx Radio. The chairman of Ramsey Commissioners says an agreement over the future of the town's historic courthouse will have a positive impact on ratepayers. Not-for-profit group The Heart of Ramsey Limited has agreed a contract with the local authority to develop the site as a community hub. Andy Cowie says as a collection of local figures, the group has the best interests of the town at heart and has described the plans as pretty special. He explained to me what the financial impact of the project would be on the people of Ramsey. The concept is that the the building will be self-financing for the ratepayer once it's it's, it's up and running on on, on its feet, although Ramsey Commission will retain ownership of the actual building and provide a lease to Thor to operate it. There should be a positive impact on the ratepayer, so we'll get a facility for the north of the island, and, and Ramsey in particular, at minimal cost other than the purchase price that we've already bought. Ramsey Commissioners purchased this site in a well-publicised uh, negotiation with government back a couple of years ago now, 2017. So why has it taken so long to get to this stage? I mean, firstly, just to point out, we are using the courthouse. It's certainly not sat, sat idle. We've had a, a huge number of events and exhibitions and, and, and the like over the last 12 months and continue to do so. So it, it's, it's by no means idle. It's been an asset to the town already. But yeah, um, there was some deliberations with the finances, ensuring we actually got the lease deal. It's quite a complicated arrangement uh, because it's tied in with the uh, rental of of the police station to DHA as well, so the the actual capital costs were relatively minimal. And then we had to go out and expressions of interest. We had quite a large number of people putting forward proposals, all of which had some merit. Mm. There were some very interesting and exciting proposals. Can you tell us how many? Uh, It's been a while, actually, (laughs) Jaron. I think this probably we had about uh, six or seven submissions of you know magnitude, as well as quite a, a huge amount of ideas and, and thoughts as well that went into the process, and we think this proposal will capture most of those. Was this your first choice? I, I got not a liberty to say that no, but uh, there, there were certainly the preferred bidders from day one in the selection process. What state is the building in? Because Tim Baker had said half a million pounds they're going to have to need, and, and that would suggest there's quite a lot of work to do for what they want. Yeah, well, the proposals are quite ambitious. There's you know full redecoration throughout. There's kitting out with uh, the various facilities and removing half of the mezzanine, well, the, the upper floor and replacing it with half mezzanine will, will be quite costly. Uh, they have a professional architect team on board as part of the uh, the Thor team, so I'm quite confident that the designs will be professional and, and fully costed. What is the condition of the building, if you could describe it then? I know it is a courthouse. It was designed to be a courthouse. I mean, was it in good nick? Is it, is it in good nick, I should say? The fabric 
fabric of the building is in really good condition for a building of that age. The roof's sound, the walls are sound, windows are good. It is yeah. the format that's the problem. It, it still does look like an empty courthouse stroke post office stroke police station. What's happening to the courthouse in the meantime? You're going to continue to use it as you have been? with it? Very much so, yeah. There's there's a full uh, full list of events, uh, including topically the Thor are having an open day on the 29th and 30th of June, which if anyone's interested in the plans would be well worth visiting and speaking to the team there and perhaps putting some ideas forward. Tim Baker, MHK, is part of this team of obviously community, members of the community from, from the north of the island all involved. Is there a a sense that it was the right decision because because of that, because they were community figures that you were putting it in the right hands rather than, I suppose, an investor from somewhere else off island, perhaps? Yes, very much so. The team itself are very professional and, and have the interests of the town, the north at heart, and some track record of, of these type of developments as well. And the key facts are it's a not-for-profit organisation. We know they aren't going to be there to make money out of the courthouse. It's there as a community facility. And also they've agreed to have a member of the board on the operational board of Thor as well once that's up and running. So we'll have still have some say in, in what is happening within the courthouse as well, which is uh, much appreciated. If the 12 months runs out and the funding hasn't been acquired, what happens then? We are prepared to be flexible. Obviously, you, you know, these sort of things come together very quickly or they may take a bit longer and we wouldn't want to spoil this opportunity by putting arbitrary deadlines on it. The, the courthouse is continuing to operate for the town. So, so we're not desperate to get it uh, revamped mm. and up and running. So, so you so. wouldn't put a put out for more expressions of interest if that time period lapses. It's sort of a, a we, 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 we've got review points throughout the process. So we'll be talking closely to the Thor team. We're not just going to leave them to, to get on with it on their own, and they, they'll be feeding back where they're up to. Uh, so we'll have a pretty good handle on where where they are throughout that twelve months period. And if it can be accelerated, so much the better. The chairman of Ramsey Commissioners, Andy Cowie. And finally, a member of the House of Keys is to be honoured for his work helping those overcoming addiction and trauma. Douglas North MHK Ralph Peake has won the Politician of the Year Award at the DB Recovery and McLean Hospital Addiction Recovery Awards. He's been recognised for his work with Manx trauma recovery charity Quing. The Douglas North MHK spoke about the accolade to Tim Glover. The organisation that um, uh, have these awards is in the UK, so that, that's where they're coming from. And, and I'll have the opportunity to, to perhaps shed some light on the benefits of the Isle of Man and our parliament here in the Isle of Man. So t- with respect, they probably don't know that much about the Isle of Man uh, uh, political system. But uh, no, it, it's, it's great, really. This is something which um, uh, is organised by DB Recovery along with McLean Hospital. And McLean Hospital are uh, supported by... Yale University in 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 the US, and it's really to help people who are in that sort of difficult um, space, perhaps, uh, and perhaps suffering from addiction, perhaps some mental health issues in that area as well, um, perhaps from some childhood experience, um, an adverse childhood experience, or maybe something in their youth, and and what happens then is sort of plays out then in, as a life uh, goes on. So they've, well, um, they've nominated you as, or named you as Politician of the Year for your work obviously with Quing. That's correct yes, so it's the work we're doing here with Quing and the Isle of Man and, and it's, a, it's a great honour to receive that on, on behalf of the uh, organisation and what, what the uniqueness uh, they've actually seen is the fact that we actually have, part of the, the charity actually works with people in the community and uh, we have this concept called asset-based community development and that's all about trying to recognise the strengths in people, the strengths strengths in those small communities. And we've had a, a series of talks. Uh, we've had a number of speakers over, but we Cormac Russell has been our main speaker on this. Um, and he had a series of talks throughout uh, last year, 19, uh, 2019. And he's back again um, now in, in June. So on the 19th of June, um, he's talking at Onken Parish Hall. And on the 21st of June, he's talking at the Castletown town hall so this is a second series of his talks and this will really just talk to a small group of members in the community and and help them see then the benefits of of working together and what you can actually do for each other um it's a fascinating um concept and it really is very low cost if you like uh, it's something that can really enrich people's lives and it uh, brings people together i believe you were nominated by someone who's benefited from the work of the charity that, that's correct. That's absolutely correct. So, uh, yeah, Graham Klukas uh, sort of started uh, the founder of the charity and he's benefited uh, a lot um, from from the work we've done over here now. And, you know, working with Graham, has, has, it's been great, really. I've, I've learned so much from him um, and I've been able to um, work alongside him and we've, we've pu- pushed together and we've got 
got it now on a, on a footing where people can start to understand it and are, are now listening to listening to what we're actually doing. The other side of the charity is really helping the members who are in that difficult spot. And what we've chosen to do is to go and down. This the is ed- coming out of addiction and uh, yes, mental. It could be, yes, yes, that's right. Um, you could have an a addiction. A cross section, really. Isn't exactly, it? yes. We try not to label anybody there, so it's people who, who are uh, su- suffering at a difficult point in their time. But the reason what we're trying to do is help on an education side. So we're trying to help them educate them w- the way out. And we offer an accredited course. Now, this is with the Laser Awards. Um, division down there in Portsmouth and we've actually got an accredited course here and it's running now it started in May of this year so we've got a group of 15 people who are taking this and they will actually get a qualification at the end of it a level one qualification which is similar to a GCSE level Uh, but they'll have a qualification in in the uh, in the trauma that they're suffering so they'll start to understand how things are affecting them and it, and it talks about uh, it talks about the brain it talks about your um, nervous system how your body reacts to um, stimulants how it reacts to uh, depression and it really helps them understand so at the end of an eight week course um, they'll have an accreditation and for some of these people they, they perhaps dropped out of school they didn't get any qualifications so this could this be is, a stepping stone for them this is absolutely the stepping stone it's the ladder if you like to, to get out of where they are onto uh, a higher level and the community will be more accepting of them that's the whole idea to to build up that self-esteem through accreditation uh, that can be recognized by people um, to help them then get into society and then contribute and the great thing is the group of people we've actually got they want to be there you know they want to move on and it's a cross-section of people young people uh, middle-aged even um, even some older people and there's no point in your life that you're, you're never too old to learn. That's all from the programme. We'll be back with more from Agenda next week. And you can listen again to this episode online as a podcast. But for now, Gurumayu and see you next time.